Good morning, uh, members, officers, and uh, members of the public who are tuning into this cabinet meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council. Um, we have a limited number of cabinet members in the room today because of the uh, because of COVID, um, but the rest of the cabinet are participating remotely online. Um, only those members who are present in the room will be able to move or second motions or to vote. Uh, please, with people tuning in, indicate in the chat that they would like to speak, please, and I will take people, hopefully, in the order in which they, uh, they indicate. Um, can I just uh, confirm, Jonathan, please, that the meeting is quorate? Good morning, Leader. Thank you. I can confirm the meeting is quorate. Thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Bill Handley, Councillor Toby Hawkins, and myself, Councillor Bridget, Bridget Smith, present. Um, right. So, do we, uh, Jonathan, do we have any apologies for absence today, please? No apologies of absence have been received from any members of the Cabinet. Thank you very much. And are there any declarations of interest from uh, members of Cabinet, please? No, no declarations of interest. Um, moving on to item four, the minutes of the previous meeting. Members are asked to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of December 2021. Um, I, I, I move the approval of those minutes as a correct record. Is that seconded? Councillor Toomey Hawkins is seconding it. Um, and are there any issues? Sorry, she's waving at me because she wants to speak on the minutes. Um, but you can second them as well. So, uh, uh, sorry, Councillor uh, Hawkins, leader. would you like to uh, speak to the minutes, please? Um, sorry, Leader, it's not to the, to the minutes of the meeting, right. to acknowledging other councillors who might be in the chamber and online. Yes. Uh, we've not done that. Sorry, what, sorry, what haven't I done? Acknowledging members who are either in... You want, the, me, want, want me to acknowledge them by name, do you, the people who are online? Uh, and in the chamber. And in the chamber. Oh, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, Councillor Anna Bradham is, pre is present in the, in the room as well, and um, everybody else is online. So my apologies, Councillor Bradham. Right, going back to the minutes. Are there any issues arising from the minutes, please? No? So I shall move that the minutes are approved. Is that seconded, please? Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to second that. Do members agree to approve the minutes? Does anyone wish to vote against? And anyone wish to abstain? Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the approval of the minutes as a correct record by affirmation. So moving on to item five, public questions. So we've received four public questions, and the first of those is from Mr. Daniel Fulton, who is attending in person. Um, Mr. Fulton, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, I would. I'd also like to correct the record and say that the Council received five questions one of which you have unlawfully refused to allow the member of the public to ask in violation of her right of freedom of expression under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I would appreciate if you could please, please acknowledge that, Chair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Fulton, um, we emailed uh, Mrs. Williams, who submitted the question on the 6th of January, explaining why her question could not be accepted. And this email was resent to her at 6.52 this morning when she emailed late last night to request that you would be asking the question on her behalf. So would you like to ask your question now, please? Uh, it would have been nice if you would have given reasons. Uh, there, were, there was a reason given, and the question was refused on the basis that the council was made aware the matter may be the subject of legal proceedings. That is not a legitimate grounds to refuse, the, to refuse Mrs. Williams to ask the question. That is completely unlawful, and this council has enough legal problems as it is without you further wasting public expenses on needless legal proceedings. Councillor Smith, this is not acceptable. You need to allow Mrs. Williams' question to be asked. And what is the harm of allowing her to ask the question? I'm going to refer what you've said to um, our head of legal services. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, Mr. Fulton, the Council does have a very clear public speaking protocol, uh, and you're simply wrong in the comments that you've just made. And the Chair did have the lawful authority to refuse the question. Point five of the public speaking scheme says that the chair, having regard to the advice of the proper officer, 
May I reject the question or statement? If it refers to any matter which is or may be the subject of legal proceedings. Now, as you well know, that there was a Zoom meeting organised last Thursday night in which you gave a presentation about it. And so on that advice to the chair, that is the reason why the question was refused. Thank you, Chair. Th uh, through the chair, thank you for that response, Mr. McKenna. But as you know, the council's constitution must be interpreted in accordance with the statutory laws of the United Kingdom. And parliament has seen fit in 1998 to enact the Human Rights Act, which made the European Convention on Human Rights part of the statutory laws of this country. And this council is subject to the constitutional laws of the United Kingdom, whether you like it or not. Mr. Fulton, I'm not prepared to debate this now. Would you like to ask your question, please? I will proceed. Thank you. Uh, my remarks today concern how this council has systematically and intentionally violated the civil rights of the residents of South Cambridgeshire for the political advantage of the majority political group. I was speaking with a barrister recently who's, who has many years of experience in dealing with local authorities, and he told me that there are two kinds of local authorities, member-led authorities and officer-led authorities. Um, and I think he almost got that right. But in fact, there are two kinds of, office, of local authorities, officer-controlled authorities and member-controlled authorities. And I very much regret to say that this is undoubtedly an Mr. officer. Mr. Fulton, could you please stick to the question which you've, you've submitted to this council? You are way off what you've submitted to the council. I could have three minutes to, to state my question. Councillor Smith, I have freedom of expression. I and have a right to Mr. say what Fulton, I want to say treat, in this meeting. Mr. Fulton, this I'm is treating, not your... you, treating you with respect. I would please request that you treat me with similar respect and mod modulate how you're talking to me, please. Thank you, Chair. On the 8th of September, moments after serious allegations of misconduct were made against this council, the audio of this council's planning committee was abruptly terminated. Last week, I met with the council's new head of HR and corporate governance, who indicated that he had not carried out any investigation into the events, despite the fact that these allegations have been made to the leader of the council, the chair of the planning committee, and the executive counselor for planning in addition to the chair of the council who is here today and the chair of the council's employment committee. Why there has been no investigation into this completely boggles my mind. If there has been an investigation done, it has only been done by the officers who apparently took part in the misconduct. And that is simply unacceptable. It is also unacceptable that this council has threatened the honest law-abiding members of this council with trumped up code of conduct proceedings if they seek access to information that relates to the misconduct that occurred on the 8th of September. That is completely unacceptable. This council is, is, has always had governance problems, but in the past four years, it has deteriorated to the point where it, democracy is unable to function that there is so much concealment and cover-up of public information that it has become impossible for counselors to do their jobs. It is a shameful scenario, and it's frankly unacceptable. Thank God there's an election coming up in May. Uh, question number one, Councillor Smith, if you would like to answer it. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. So you have previously asked for information uh, regarding uh, the planning meeting on the 8th of September 2021, and we have provided responses to three requests under the Freedom of Information Act. Now, while we're not obliged to inform you whether or not the data is held, as, ex as explained in response 10130, it was made clear to you in our FOIA responses 9704 and 9779 that we do not hold the data you seek as this is an outsourced service. With regards to your reference to the automated logs, again, I refer you to the previous requests you've made on this topic under FOI request 
9779 and 10130 and our uh, outstanding and our outstanding request that you clarify you clarify the nature of the data you are seeking in FOI 10154 in order to determine whether we can confirm the existence of data or disclose it we need to understand if it falls within the category which could represent a security risk to the organization. We have previously asked that you make it clear whether you are seeking messages relating to technical information or general communications, and we await your reply. Please also note that we have informed you and reiterate this now that further requests concerning technical information from council systems regarding the meeting on the 8th of September 2021 will be classed as vexatious and not responded to. Clear explanation and reasoning for refusal or exemptions has already been provided on several occasions. Do you have a supplementary question, Mr. Fulton? I do. I have a supplementary comment and question. Firstly, the exemption under Section 311A of the Freedom of Information Act uh, 2000 is not applicable here. This is a complete nonsense. The fact that you have been advised to say this calls this council into serious disrepute, and it is, there is no basis for that. Secondly, yes, some, infer some tasks have been outsourced to VPAV Limited. However, I very much doubt that the personal device in use by the head of paid service on the 8th of September is a device owned by VPAV Limited. If it was, I would invite the council to clarify that. Secondly, the, what you have called responses under the Freedom of Information Act do not actually constitute responses as defined under section one and 10 of the act. This council needs to get serious legal advice uh, about the meaning of the Freedom of Information Act. You also failed to mention that this council failed to comply with lawful obligations under the duty of disclosure. If your intention here is to waste the resources of the Fuse Lane Consortium so that they cannot be used in political activities, that is a complete abuse of process and is, a, is a, an abuse of your position as leaders of, of this council. That's all I have to say. We're reaching the point where we're soon to have to call for resignations. Even if no one resigns, I trust the voters of this district will do the right thing in May. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bolton. I didn't detect a question there, so thank you for your time. Right, uh, moving on to the next question, uh, which is from um, Jenny Conroy, who I believe is attending the meeting remotely. Oh, sorry, I can't keep glasses and masks on all at once. Something, something keeps giving. Um, Ms. Conroy, would you like to uh, pose your question? Thanks very much, Chair. Can you just confirm you can hear me clearly? Uh, we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this is a statement I've put forward in relation to agenda item eight, and it's a statement in support of a vote today to postpone agreement of the proposed submission of NECAP at Reg 19. I've also included in my statement, which has been circulated, supporting evidence I appreciate councillors have a tremendous amount of paperwork to get through. I'm assuming today, Chair, that I don't have time to read through the supporting evidence, but I do want um, Cabinet to be aware that there is further information supporting this statement. So the statement itself, national planning policy requires developing local plans to be flexible, to accommodate changes in circumstances. What appear to be the most appropriate course of action to attain a planning objective in one year may be less apparent a few years on. It is also a requirement that all reasonable alternatives have been identified and considered, that the plans are achievable and reflect both national and local planning policies. There have been a number of changes and new circumstances since South Cams voted to support Anglian Waters application for HIF funding that enabled Anglian Water to start the process of seeking a viable alternative site for their water treatment plant in order to release that brownfield site from which it currently operates for housing. This is also relevant with regard to the objectives of the timetable specified in the local plan development scheme. 
in this case to progress to formal agreement by the councils of the proposed submission of NECAP at this time, two years ahead of public consultation, with an explicit objective to facilitate a successful DCO examination. I quote, the formal agreement by the councils of the proposed submission AAP will be an important factor in the DCO examination process to demonstrate commitment to development of the area. The size and scale of NECAP as currently presented and the now proposed relocation of the large scale industrial wastewater treatment plant into open Greenbelt in close proximity to Cambridge City and principal conservation areas will have significant impact on Cambridge itself. However, it will be the population and electorate served by South Cams that will be most affected. In particular, Milton, from the high population growth on its doorstep and impact on existing green infrastructure, and of course, particularly Milton Park. And as a result of the relocation of the wastewater treatment plant, the villages of Horningsey, Fenditton, Stoke and Quay and Lode. It is argued that the changes that have, occur, have occurred, those that remain uncertain and new information that has come forward since the initial support behind the relocation project, and as I say, supported in the um, attached uh, further documentation, are such that it would be in the best interest of South Cams and the population it serves to postpone agreement of the proposed submission until after the outcome of the DCO and also the outcome of the public consultation, Reg 18, on the emerging local plans. It's important for South Cams to retain flexibility and influence in the planning process with regards to NECAP, its size, scale, etc., and also to retain effective scrutiny and influence over the design and mitigation measures Anglian Water put forward for the new plant at Reg 19 of the DCO, and for South Cams to be open to alternatives within the developing local plan that are achievable, most compatible with proposed local planning policies, and in the best interest of the population South Cams serve. In keeping with, um, sorry, that this will be best achieved to postpone the agreement of the post submission to allow the DCO to be examined on its own merits without further direct influence by South Cams and for South Cams to remain open to alternatives and outcomes from the public consultation of, from, the, from the first proposals. This would also reflect the guidance received from the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Services that the DCO application is not a project or proposal within the scope of the emerging um, local plan or area action plan to influence. And clearly the objective behind pushing the vote through today, two years ahead of a public um, consultation, is in effect to make to have an influence. Thank you, Chair. That concludes my statement. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Conroy, and uh, for your carefully considered um, piece. I think um, we will be discussing many of the points that you've brought up when we get to that part of the agenda, sure. so I hope you'll stay to hear, hear what's you. said then. But in the meantime, Councillor Toomey Hawkins will respond directly to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, Mrs Conroy, thank you very much for your statement, uh, seeking the postponement of the AAP at this stage. Having considered your statement, I believe that your concerns break down into a number of specific areas, and I will seek to address those uh, and respond to them here. I understand your request for a postponement is based upon concern around the full impact of the proposals contained within the uh, AAP being considered, notably the effects. Councillor Hawkins, sorry, um, it's getting slightly muffled. I wonder if you would mind removing your mask just for this. And then I'm put happy it back to on do that. Um, Thank you very much. Indeed. With your permission. I understand your request for a postponement is based upon the concern around the full impact of the proposals in the AAP being considered, notably the effects of the relocated water treatment works on the communities close to the proposed site in Honey Hill. As the report has tried to set out, however, the two processes of plan making and the consent process for the relocation are handled separately. The council's local plan evidence base makes clear that 
the NEC is one of the most sustainable locations for future needs to be accommodated. The argument in favor of the funding provided to allow for the relocation is that it enables sustainable growth to be delivered on that site. From a process started in 2014, both Cambridge City Council and South Camps have been exploring ways in which this area can be developed effectively. And this is because we know that if we cannot develop the area effectively, we will need to meet that need in other ways, on other sites, in other locations, which are likely to include greenfield sites elsewhere in the district. You have highlighted how densification, development at Cambridge Airport, and options for development elsewhere in the Green Belt, such as the biomedical campus, might meet that additional demand. But we are already considering development in some of those locations, such as Cambridge Airport. But each of those options also has consequences for those local communities. And we already know from our evidence-based work that Northeast Cambridge is the most sustainable location for future growth. Now, SCDC is meanwhile committed to the thorough and robust examination of the proposals for the new wastewater treatment plant. That examination takes place through the development consent order process. And given the long-term ambition for the NEC area, I do, however, believe it is right for us to continue to quantify and shape the redevelopment of the NEC area and set out clearly how the potential of this site can be realized as part of the AAP process. The AAP, as you know, will not progress to consultation until the DCU process, including its identification of impacts has concluded. And likewise, we will not be able to finalize our spatial strategy for the whole of Greater Cambridge until the outcome of that process is known. But I do think it is important to progress our work on this in parallel to the DCO process. Not least, to provide a context for proposals that may well come forward ahead of the adoption of the AAP on those parts of the site that are less impacted by the wastewater treatment use. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Um, Ms Conroy, have you got a, sep a supplementary question you'd like to ask? Um, well, yes, thank you. I mean, difficult to formulate one so immediately. So if you'll just allow me just to clarify something. I think what I, I completely respect um, uh, the uh, response that I've just received. I think what's disappointing, however, is that we find ourselves in a position where this apparent lack of transparency about what the outcomes of the development of NECAP will be on other parts of Greater Cambridge um, in the uh, local documentation is qualified, and I totally accept the legal situation that the two planning processes are separate. And yet what's absolutely clear, and, and, and that the um, local councils aren't in a position to interfere or influence the DCO, and yet what's absolutely clear is that today's vote two years ahead of the public consultation, the singular objective is to actually support that DCO application. And I'm disappointed really that that isn't being, a, well, I suppose I'm, 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 I, I, I'm appealing to cabinet to, to take that on board, is that in one respect, you know, things are being kept separate because of legal process. And yet today, however, um, in order to support the application, which is clearly having a direct, it will have a direct influence, um, it's, it's, it's being proposed. Um, so that's just a, a comment to finish on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, we had a pre-meeting uh, and we, we discussed exactly the point you're, you're making. And of course, there are always, you know, there's, there's always consequences to, uh, to delays. And I'm going to ask Mr. Stephen Kelly to um, share with you the explanation that he shared with Cabinet earlier today about what the, uh, what the consequences could be of delaying this decision, because actually, I, I mean, I hope you will see that actually they, they have potential to be you know, very undesirable indeed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, 
Uh, actually, just to, just to clarify, firstly, the point uh, about supporting um, the DCA process. Uh, in many respects, the purpose of the um, Council's decision on the Area Action Plan uh, is to clarify um, what uh, the uh, opportunity at NEC is as part of the Area Action Plan. Um, the assessment as to whether or not um, the benefits uh, of development of the Area Action Plan um, uh, outweigh the impacts on the Green Belt that I know that uh, a number of people have expressed as a concern is obviously a matter for the inspector in that separate uh, legal process. Um, the decision of the council essentially seeks to confirm and clarify the council's ambitions for the NEC site, uh, uh, which is um, inevitably a consideration um, for the um, inspector in due course uh, in the event that the DCO progresses. Um, but, the, but the request for delay uh, as uh, Ms. Conroy has highlighted, uh, the Council's Local Development Scheme sets out the basis upon which the um, local authority will bring forward its development plans. Uh, and that's quite important because local authorities are required to have an up-to-date local plan, which is defined by the NPPF as a plan that's less than five years old. Uh, now, the timetable, because of the development consent order process, is already extraordinarily tight on that uh, and puts the council in a position where um, its plan may not be uh, less than five years old by the time we're able to replace it because of the development consent order process. Uh, now at this stage uh, our advice has been um, that uh, preparing the local plan, joint local plan, uh, and recognizing the sustainability criteria of um, uh, the NECAP site um, uh, justifies perhaps extending the deadline for the local plan beyond that because of the significance of the site in meeting the future needs of the um, Greater Cambridge area. Um, but obviously further extension of the timeline uh, for the um, uh, development consent order process that might arise uh, were the council not to quantify its position in respect of um, uh, the quantums of development, for example, or the type of scheme that comes forward on NECAP uh, may well have implications for the development consent order process and timeline uh, or indeed its, um, uh, its outcome uh, that uh, caused the council to have to review uh, its own local plan timeline further or indeed uh, to uh, have to consider alternatives to North East Cambridge in meeting the need that we've identified through the process. Uh, and Ms. Conroy has identified uh, in uh, some of her representations uh, other potential locations, but of course we've discounted um, some of those options. Members will recall we discounted some 600 plus sites that were advanced for development across the district um, because we were able to focus on highly sustainable locations such as NEC. So um, there is a reason for progressing with the AAP um, uh, at, at this stage. Um, quite rightly, there is a process in the development consent order um, examination which will consider whether or not the council's ambitions set out in this document uh, justify the harm to the green belt that uh, I know is a cause of concern amongst other things uh, around um, the water treatment works relocation. Um, but by making the decision today, you allow the full and proper consideration of that to happen in the development consent order process in a reasonable timeline. Uh, if we defer consideration of that item uh, today, um, there is less certainty and indeed less clarity about the respective council's positions uh, on the NECAP area, uh, and that can't be properly and fully uh, considered uh, by the uh, appropriate inspector. Uh, and of course, the, the document in front of you today is an evolution, quite substantial evolution, from the previous document, which is the only position that would be in front of the inspector um, at, at that point. So our advice is, noting the concerns that um, Ms. Connery has highlighted, um, that it is appropriate to proceed. We're not uh, uh, supporting that process uh, in the way that I think she's suggesting. We're clarifying the council's position on what NECAP contributes to Greater Cambridge, um, and that 
uh, that will then form part of the inspector's consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Um, Councillor Hawkins, is there anything you want to add to that before we move on? No, perhaps I, thank you very much indeed for your, for your question. Um, so moving on to uh, Mrs. Catherine Martin, um, who I think is also attending uh, remotely and uh, has, a, has a related question. Morning. Morning. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I've, I've got a question. I'm quite concerned about the um, kneecap de development um, in, in terms of, of traffic and misery for existing residents. Um, the AAP proposes introducing 15,000 jobs into the area, um, bearing in mind that many people will be travelling from locations where there is poor access to public transport. How many people do you estimate will be travelling to the area by car? There will also be 4,500 densely packed homes. Your transport studies concede that the roads are already at capacity and local residents really don't want any more traffic misery. Um, how much confidence do you have in the ability to control the development by the notion of a trip budget? Um, I just don't know how you can introduce so many extra people into such a small area without a massive impact on existing roads and residents. Uh, thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, I think you're going to respond. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you, Ms. Martin, for your uh, question. It is an interesting one. Um, but it, it is clear, though, that the only way that the comprehensive uh, and sustainable delivery of the um, Northeast Cambridge site can be achieved is if those sites significantly reduce their vehicle trip generation below the current levels. Now, as you will know, the Cambridgeshire County Council Highways Authority is responsible for highways matters. It has moved away from the traditional approach of traffic management towards a vehicular trip budget model. And the principle of the trip budget is to identify the maximum level of external vehicular peak hour trips allowed for the development when it's fully built out, which would not result in a deterioration in the performance of the surrounding highway networks over the existing levels. And to achieve this, developers will be subject to a strict trip budget and will need to show how they can meet those with measures to limit the number of vehicle trips allowed to and from each site. And development will not be permitted if proposals cannot demonstrate how they will achieve that budget. And also there will be traffic monitoring actually to ensure compliance with those trip budgets. Now Highways has undertaken traffic modeling to help inform the assessment of the proposals in the AAP and to define how the trips will be shared amongst the various sites. Now, on the basis of the modeling, um, and to ensure there is no net increase on what they consider as the baseline, which is the 2017 network, their calculations show that the AM, the morning peak from 8 to 9 AM, uh, they envisage 3,900 two-way trips. And for the afternoon peak from 1700 to 1800, i.e. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., uh, they estimate 3,000 two-way trips. Now, the morning budget um, modeling suggests that the inbound employment-based trips are roughly 2,882, and with most of these inbound, and that 1,018 residential with most of those outbound. So recognizing that the AAP adoption is some years away and some development is already happening in the area, um, the South Cams and Cambridge City Council's Joint Development Control Committee has agreed some development principles based upon applying those strip budgets to help inform um, how we assess all new plan applications coming forward on that site. 
and officers from our Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service and the Highways Authority are therefore already seeking to address the concerns that residents have um, on this issue. Um, I mean, there's a lot more information that uh, you can find in the transport position statement, the high-level transport strategy document, and the transport evidence base, all of which are available on the Greater Cambridge Planning website. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor um, Hawkins. Um, Mrs Martin, do you have a supplementary question you'd like to ask? Um, no, thank you for that. I'm, I'm still not totally confident that there will be this this control over these you know over the developers and over the years um i'm just also wanted to say that um NECAP and the local plan do deal with the long-term vision for cambridge and by not um discussing the loss of the green belt at honey hill at the same time as a valley beating kneecap how can you claim to be looking at the whole future of cambridge it doesn't just they just don't make sense to me but that's just my statement really thank you thank you very much and thank you very much indeed um the the minutes will include all the uh, the full response that councillor hawkins gave it was quite detailed so uh, hopefully you'll be able to sort of study it in more detail then um and again this will all be debated later on in the meeting but thank you very much for for your time in asking a question uh, so our fourth questioner is uh, mr james littlewood um and is james online hi bridget yes I'm hello james here. nice to see you would you you had quite a long uh, you submitted quite a long statement um but over to you now thank you i'm aware that has been circulated chair so i will abbreviate slightly uh, to uh, spay going through that again um i wanted to say uh, firstly that there's much to commend uh, in this aap the environmental aspirations but uh, the provision of natural green space unfortunately is not one of them the amount that's being proposed is really the minimum required to meet the council's policies, but two thirds of the green space will be on a business park. And I'd certainly ask you as councillors to wonder whether you would want a visit of business park for your leisure and recreation. And, and also that the green space is not a green, new green space, it's existing space already. Only a third of the green space that's being provided is actually in conjunction with the housing. And most of that is provided as linear green space or pocket parks. In other words, small areas of green space that will be adjacent to very high rise buildings. There is one larger park. The size of that's not provided in any of the documents, but we estimate that to be around about three hectares in size. And figure 20 in your report compares that with other parks in Cambridge, which is a bit misleading really, because uh, the other comparisons are actually parks rather than bits of green space. So if you consider the three hectares uh, for 16,000 people in comparison with some of the other parks that you're given in that document, you'll see that it's actually very small space indeed. So as a bare minimum, the proposals might provide for the day-to-day -day open space needs of residents, somewhere for them to children to play, walk the dog, kick a ball about. But it, what it won't do is provide the kind of green space that people in high density developments very much need access to, which is large natural green space, somewhere they can go for a long walk or run, experience nature and escape the pressures of urban life. And there is, of course, somewhere for them to do that, to Milton Country Park. There's a subway proposed under the A14 so that the 16,000 people can get to it. And of course, that's exactly where they can go. And that would be great if it were not for the fact that the Country Park is already at capacity and can't cope with 16,000 more visitors. In the hundreds of pages of text that you've got in front of you, there's almost no mention of Milton Country Park at all, let alone about it meeting the needs of the development. There's been no assessment of whether the Country Park has the capacity to cope and what mitigation might be required to enable it to do so. And we can see no requirement for Section 106 contributions to support the park, only a rather vague paragraph on page 54 of the Open Spaces and Recreation topic paper. So that you're aware, Natural England's accessible natural green space standards would require the development to have a large 100 hectare site of accessible natural green space within five kilometres, especially as this development is to be car free. Uh, but there isn't one. And to make matters worse, to the north of Cambridge, you will see uh, also 20,000 people at North Stowe, 22,000 people at Waterbeach. So where will these 58,000 people go to meet their green space needs is the question. Uh, and the, uh, this area has been highlighted, as you're probably aware, in the evidence base for the next local plan as suffering from a deficit of green infrastructure. Um, and that report highlights the northeast Cambridge to Waterbeach area as a priority for green infrastructure with its enhancement marked as of critical importance. 
Officers have suggested uh, when I presented this to the scrutiny committee that funding for that critical green space could be provided through a new requirement in the next local plan. And if that's possible, then that would be very welcome and it would alleviate the concerns of Cambridge PPF and, and Cambridge Sports Lake Trust. However, as yet, there's no proposal in place for such a scheme and it would need to be improved by a planning inspector. So in short, at this stage, it's an if rather than an agreed solution. And if that does not prove possible, then it will be essential that Section 106 contributions are secured from the NEC development towards this critical strategic green infrastructure. So my Crest Cabinet is pleased will you recommend that the AAP is not progressed until there's a commitment within it for development contributions towards mitigating the impacts on Milton Country Park and providing the larger scale green space that will be desperately needed by the future 58,000 residents of North East Cambridge, Water Beach and North Stowe, either from a new mechanism in the local plan or failing that through Section 106 contributions. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, James, uh, and for all your constructive um, comments. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Toomey Hawkins to hopefully um, allay some of your, your concerns. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you, James, uh, Mr. Littlewood. <laughs> um, and especially thanks for your commendation of our environmental aspirations in the um, NCAAP. And yes, um, I do note your disappointment relating to the provision of natural green space, but I do hope that today's response does go some way to alleviating your concerns in that regard. Now, the AAP requires development to bring forward 27.6 hectares of new informal and children's play space across the area. And that is equivalent of around 34 and a half football pitches or around three times the size of Parker's Peaks. Now, in combination with the existing open spaces at the NAC, um, including existing and redesigned spaces on the employment parks, the plan will meet the informal and children's play space requirements um, in the adopted local plans on site. And this means that all residents will have access to open space within a five minute walk of their homes for day to day informal recreation and access within the Northeast Cambridge site and to a range of different types of spaces for people to enjoy. Now, some of the proposed open space areas are substantial in size. And um, altogether, actually, the spaces on the NEC site account for an area that is comparable with Milton Country Park. The new large green space is 4.1 hectares, um, which is around the same size as Christ pieces or five football pitches. And similarly, we have the main, the linear park, which is between 70 meters and 100 meters wide, and is, uh, which is, I, I'm told, the length of a football pitch, and it's over 1.3 kilometers long. Um, now, as required by the AAP, a landscape-led approach to designing these spaces will ensure that there will be opportunities for individuals and families, residents and workers, to go for walks, run, play, and experience nature on their doorstep, and that includes the spaces in the business parks. Um, regarding our concern, I, I, I'd like to point out that we've set out in policy BG stroke G1 green infrastructure in the first proposals of the uh, emerging local plan, um, for which we've just finished the consultation last month. Now the council, the, both. South Camps and the city are seeking to bring forward new strategic scale green spaces in that area. So the, the, the nearest um, area identified, of course, to the NEC is that area that we've identified in the policies map as area six, North Cambridge green space. And this area could provide the new opportunities for open space to serve not only um, you know, the new developments, as you've mentioned, the NEC, um, Water Beach and Nostal, but it could also serve 
existing communities. Now, these WADA proposals, of course, fall outside the AAP area, and due to their more strategic role, will be considered further as the councils prepare the Greater Cambridge Local Plan. Now, policy eight of the Area Action Plan already requires plan obligations uh, to be applied to ensure delivery of on and off site provision of open, open space uh, linked and effectively phased to the delivery of new homes. Therefore, the AAP already proposes to seek contributions towards off site open space where it is necessary to support the development. And whilst we note that the um, uh, planning permission for the extension to Milton Country Park has lapsed, earmarking such contributions solely to that project would, at this stage, not be sensible given that the delivery of that additional space is not yet assured. Instead, through the AAP proposed policy, there will remain scope to invest in delivering new off-site infrastructure to serve the NEC and other communities' formal open space needs. I hope that helps. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Thank Councillor you. Hawkins. Um, Mr Littlewood, have you got a supplementary question? Uh, well, I, I, only that, um, obviously my point is that the AAP doesn't specifically require that, and that's my concern, is, is that the wording, the wording that's in here is, is if it can be shown to be needed. And I, and I think we all agree, probably, I hope we all agree on the things, that it is needed. And therefore, I don't understand why the AAP can't just clearly state that there will be a requirement for off-site provision from Section 106. And that makes it clear, rather than us having to have a battle every time an application comes forward to secure that Section 106 funding. Uh, thank you. So, I mean, I don't, I don't envision us having any battles at all. I mean, I hope you, you know, I hope you accept that we work very closely with your organisation and that you're a very important uh, part of the process for us and uh, that we will always do our best to, uh, to you know, accommodate, accommodate your concerns, um, which are, you know, as well, as well motivated as ours are to make this an exceptional development where, you know, where, where nature is at the, at the fore and where people's health and well-being is absolutely critical. I'm just going to ask uh, Mr. Kelly, perhaps Stephen Kelly, just to comment. And um, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, th thank you, Leader. Um, uh, and uh, as Little Mr. Littlewood knows, obviously um, there's a kind of relationship here between the wider local plan that Councillor Hawkins has tried to highlight in terms of establishing these strategic green infrastructure assets um, uh, in locations uh, outside of, but uh, proximate to the city and to new settlements. Uh, that is a that is something we've just finished consultation of. Uh, I think in terms of the semantics about um, a requirement versus uh, 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 an expectation um, set out in the current draft policy, I my own expectation is that subject to um, the responses that we've received to the um, first proposals, which identify those strategic locations as the plans in parallel progress forwards, we will have greater certainty around some of that infrastructure. Um, but that, that infrastructure and certainty around it is important in order for the plans to be found sound at examination. Um, uh, and so I suspect we will uh, continue to keep under review the precise terms of the AAP, uh, having regards to the certainty of those uh, both strategic allocations that are in the local plan uh, and their acceptance uh, and um, proposals that may or may not emerge uh, around uh, locations proximate to the city, including Milton Country Park. But at this moment in time, um, uh, as uh, Councillor Hawkins has highlighted, uh, those proposals are not definite. Uh, and um, you know, our advice is that it wouldn't necessarily be sound to make that requirement explicit at this stage, although we fully expect to uh, explore that further, recognising as I think um, Mr Littlewood has highlighted the clear ambitions of the plan to address both biodiversity emergencies and, and, and well-being um, as, a, as a cornerstone of what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so um, hopefully that offers at least uh, some assurance that officers I know uh, and I'm sure um, the organisations um, uh, of the city and South Cairns district uh, are committed to get the very best outcome from this. 
Thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you, James, for, uh, for all the effort you put into this. And we look forward to continuing to work uh, constructively with your, with your organisation jointly with uh, Cambridge City Council. So, uh, so that's the end of our questions. Um, it's always nice to have questions from the public. So thank you to all of those who've taken the, taken the trouble. Uh, so moving on to um, the next part of the meeting, which is the report from um, issues arising from the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. I don't think we've got the chair, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, here, but I think we've got Councillor Judith Rippert. Is that correct? Hello, Councillor Rippert. So uh, yeah. hello there. Um, so do you want to uh, speak to your report now or do you want to pick it up in, uh, later on in the agenda? Um, can I pick it up later on in the agenda, please? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. All right, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. OK, so moving on to item seven, which is Cambridge South Station. Um, and I thank the officers for the considerable efforts that they've put into um, our response on this. Obviously, as a council and as a uh, political group, we've been hugely supportive um, of a new station at Cambridge South. Um, but what we're doing here is um, articulating our concerns about the, uh, the detail, the things that we have reservations about. And I'm quite sure that we are um, representing what our residents would want us to say. Uh, so Councillor Neil Goff is going to present this. Um, I will be um, making the recommendation uh, since I'm in the chamber and I think Councillor Bill Handley is going to second it. So if I start off with Councillor Neil Goff, who I'm sure sure is um, got quite a lot to say on the subject. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, so as, as you said, uh, this Cambridge South Station is a critical piece of infrastructure in our area, which will uh, significantly improve connectivity um, to the uh, to the uh, biomedical campus, um, and it's a piece of infrastructure which, as you say, uh, strategically we are very supportive of. Um, but equally, we need to make sure that it is done in a optimal way, and we've been very clear um, on our expectations on projects such as this that we expect. Um, mitigation of uh, the impacts to the to the best of the uh, developers uh, ability uh, particularly on the environment so this particular item and recommendation is to reconfirm our position which was agreed at cabinet uh, in July of last year uh, in the light of the public inquiry which will be coming uh, next month uh, so since July, various discussions have taken place with Network Rail and uh, the key correspondence, which I think is very helpful, is attached to the item, which indicates that on many items there's been significant progress and the officers have been satisfied that uh, either issues have been addressed or that they will be addressed uh, within uh, the parameters of the subsequent process. Um, but there are two matters uh, which are highlighted in the report about which we still have uh, significant reservations. Uh, and these relate to mitigation of the loss of trees and assurance on the biodiversity net gain. So this, this recommendation uh, basically confirms that while we're supportive of the overall project, we will maintain our objections pending insurance on those particular two issues. Uh, and that is what we're asking Cabinet today to do, is to uh, reconfirm that position in anticipation of representations which we will be making at the public inquiry next month. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Goff. Uh, right, do any members of Cabinet wish to speak on this item? No. Um, anyone, any other members present in the room? Um, uh, oh, sorry, apologies, Councillor Brian Mills. Can't hear you yet. Uh, <laughs> Got you. Turned, yes, I'll unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that um, uh, we uh, 
put across that we're very much uh, supporting this. So these are, um, you know, particular objections. We've been campaigning for this uh, Cambridge South station for decades now. It will represent a really important and sustainable connection point to the ever-growing CBC campus, and particularly as well as a regional health centre. And I think that we, we should just make sure that everybody understands that we're very, very supportive of this development. And um, I think the only reservations that uh, we have that haven't been mentioned here is that the uh, local transport connections between the station and particularly the accident and emergency sites will be well made and a regular frequent ser service so that particularly those that are infirm and unwell can have easy access into the appropriate departments in the hospital, which aren't within walking distance. So, yeah, just wants to confirm that we're very supportive of this development. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, as chair of uh, the County Council Highways Transport Committee, uh, in December we did make a submission on Cambridge South Station, and um, I'm pleased to see that the components that we have here are fairly consistent with with that approach. In other words, we're raising issues about bio biodiversity net gain that was also raised by the county, and as Councillor Mills mentioned. Uh, whilst we're very supportive overall, we just want to make sure that the, 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 the deliverables are set out and the submission uh, really do come to pass. So um, I, I would welcome and support the submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Any members wish to speak? Uh, Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, there are a number of things I'd like to um, seek clarification on, and uh, I raised them at scrutiny and overview, and I can see that some have been picked up and referred to in the officer report. I'm sorry, I'm referring to the wrong, I'm not talking about Cambridge Station. Sorry, I apologise. You're, you're getting ahead of yourself, you're so keen, <laughs> Councillor Bradman. Okay, <laughs> we'll forgive you. Um, okay, so if I just, um, um, Summarise, and then I'll ask Councillor Handley to comment if he wishes. Um, so I think, you know, Cambridge South Station is going to be a complete game changer, uh, both for the health providers, but also for all the businesses around, around uh, the location where it's going to be. You know, it should have been delivered years ago, uh, so, and that's why we've worked really hard. I absolutely commend the letter from the uh, Principal Planning Officer. It's an excellent piece of work. And the reservations that uh, this council have highlighted, which I, uh, my understanding is very much reflect the concerns of the county council as well, are absolutely the reservations that our residents would be raising with us. And it's about trees and it's about biodiversity and it's about you know, the, making the most of the, ability, the opportunity to enhance nature rather than denude nature. So, you know, our residents expect us to be holding Network Rail to account on this. You know, we're setting really, really high standards for nature and biodiversity in this council. And part of our job is to hold other organisations to account, to make sure that they share our, our really high ambitions about this. So, you know, whilst we are very, very keen for this station to progress, it's got to be really, really good. And um, I think the report that our officers have presented here, and actually, you know, much of it's been very positively responded to already by Network Rail. So I don't think it's going to take us a lot to get, get us over the final, the final hurdle. Um, so thank you for the considerable work and for the clarity in which it's been presented in this paper. Um, Councillor Handley, do you want to add anything as the second? I, I don't think I uh, need to add anything. Thank you. I, I support and uh, agree with everything that's been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Handley. OK, so if nobody else has got anything to say on this. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think we have scrutiny. Oops, Daisy. Did scrutiny want to comment on this? I don't think it went to scrutiny, did it? No. OK, fine. Um, so the recommendation is set out at paragraph six of the report. Oh, hang on. No, no. I've got ahead of myself now as well. Councillor Bradman's thrown me as well. Uh, the recommendations set out in paragraph three of the report. 
um, and that's that we can confirm the council's position as set out in the statement of case for the public inquiry, brackets appendix A, and note the delegated authority to the joint director of planning and economic development to approve and submit the proof of evidence and statement of common ground on behalf of the council. Do members agree with the proposal? Does anyone wish to vote against the proposal? Okay. And does anyone wish to abstain? Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to item eight, which is uh, the Northeast Cambridge Area, Area Action Plan, um, which uh, we've had quite a lot of debate about already in this meeting. Um, and Councillor Toomey Hawkins is going to introduce the report and move the recommendations. And I will be happy to second the recommendations when we get to that point. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Hi, uh, thank you, Leader. And uh, once again, good morning, everyone. Uh, the report you have in front of you today is a culmination of years of work um, by both South Cambridge District Council and Cambridge City Council. Um, the adopted 2018 local plans of both councils include policies which allocate their respective sections of North East Cambridge area for development. And this policy states that the amount of development, the site capacity, the viability, the time scales, and phasing of development will be established through the preparation of an area action plan for the site. And that is what we now have. This is our proposed submission Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan. The site itself is a 182 hectares brownfield site on the edge of Cambridge. It's only 15 minute cycle uh, into the city centre. It benefits from existing transport infrastructure like the Cambridge North Station, the guided busway, the Chisholm Trail, and uh, there is more to come including the Water Beach Greenway and the uh, Water Beach to Cambridge Public Transport Corridor. Um, obviously, the proposed relocation of the wastewater treatment plant is a, uh, what I call a once in a generation opportunity to comprehensively regenerate this site and to coordinate development across the many different landowners. We've talked about this uh, already this morning. The relocation has been advanced um, by Anglia Water through a development consent order process uh, after winning funding from uh, Homes England. And the proposed submission AAP will be an important factor in that DCO exam process. As, it, as we've heard, it demonstrates the two councils' commitment to developing the area it clarifies what North East Cambridge means to the councils and how we expect it to provide sustainable new community for the future of Greater Cambridge. Um, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, <laughs> North East Cambridge site is the most sustainable location in Greater Cambridge for development. Uh, because of its location, it helps in minimizing carbon emissions from transport, which we know is one of the major contributions um, to carbon. And it gives opportunity to maximize travel by non-car modes, as we have identified in the evidence collected. And that's why it is one of the major sites proposed to deliver homes in the emerging Greater Cambridge Local Plan. The scale of development here means we are positively planning for not just the next 10 to 20 years, but beyond that, as it's an opportunity to create a meaningful legacy for this part of the city. <laughs> so, what do we have? What is proposed is 8,350 homes, of which around 4,000 will be built before 2041, and 40% will be affordable. Around 15,000 new commercial jobs, five new centers providing shop services within a five minute walk of people's front doors, reprovisioning of the existing industrial floor space to protect those important uses, and provision of open space so every home will be within a five minute walk of an open space. There's lots more, <laughs> um, you know, provision for food growing, um, you know, five indoor sports hall, um, community facilities such as cultural spaces, arts hub studios, etc. 
And very importantly, uh, biodiversity net gain is now at 20%, which is in line with the Emerging Local Plan and the wider corporate biodiversity objectives. And no fossil fuels will be on site. We'll be focusing on renewable energy. Um, taking on board all the comments that we received from the last consultation, building heights and densities have been reduced uh, based on further evidence which was uh, undertaken. Um, and also, uh, further work has been undertaken with landowners to ensure development can come forward without exceeding the TRIP budget, and you heard about that earlier on as well. Uh, that's very important to us. Um, and improved walking and cycling connections are proposed throughout the area to make sure it is integrated with the surrounding area and to make journeys by active non-car modes easy. I would like at this stage to thank all our planning policy officers who have worked continuously and tirelessly um, on this area action plan. For me, it has been a privilege to work with such talented professionals. Um, I also want to say thank you to the scrutiny committee um, who put us through the mill uh, last month. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear a bit more from uh, Councillor Badnam. However, at this stage, I propose uh, the recommendations in paragraph six on page 54 of our papers uh, to cabinet. Unless you want me to read it all out, uh, leader, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. That was all very clearly, clearly articulated. Um, I'm going to come initially to Councillor Rippers uh, to uh, talk about um, the very, as you say, the very thorough uh, review that Scrutiny and Overview gave this, and uh, we're very grateful for uh, the, the attention to detail. So, Councillor Rippers, if you would like to uh, make the points, please, on behalf of Scrutiny and Overview. Yeah, good morning, and um, perhaps I should have done this earlier. Can I formally pass on Councillor Chamberlain's apologies, the Chair of Scrutiny? Um, first of all, I'd also like to um, make the point on behalf of the scrutiny committee and um, thanking the officers for the tremendous amount of work they've put in to date and I'm sure everybody um, would support that and in trying to make this a truly sustainable development and you're right we did um, go through it with a fairly fine tooth comb and um, one point and also the officer who's written the update I think really clarifies quite succinctly the main um, comments that the committee made. One, however, of the recommendations 3A, can I again stress um, the Milton Country Park issue that it is at capacity. I know that's been stressed by a number of people already, but that needs to be taken on board today and financial contributions will need to be made to um, extend that park. I think that is, I don't want to go through all of this because you've had it, it's a bit in front of you and I think that really summarises um, all the points that were made and um, the recommendations A to F. If I think of anything later I might just ask to speak again if that's okay. Uh, you'll be you. very welcome to Councillor Ripper. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much indeed. I'm actually going to ask. Um, so you, you you mentioned in particular um, Milton Country Park and the fact that it's at capacity. Um, I just you know this isn't a simple issue at all. So I'd just like to bring in Mr. Kelly uh, just to talk about you know what the limitations are of uh, putting all our eggs eggs in the Milton Park basket and where what the alternatives should be. Uh, thank you, Lydia. Yes, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I referenced this uh, just a little earlier, um, but we, we are aware, obviously, of proposals uh, that existed previously to expand uh, Milton Country Park, um, but the planning permission for those proposals has now lapsed. Uh, and at the time that we were uh, exploring uh, that proposal further, the costs of delivering that extension to the country park were very substantial, uh, running into many millions of pounds. Um, the uh, AAP does reference uh, off-site contributions uh, and the scope for off-site contributions to deliver necessary green infrastructure, uh, but we don't yet have a certain um, 
position in terms of where and how that uh, will take place. Um, for the reasons that I, I highlighted, that uh, the, the north of Cambridge um, green infrastructure proposals in the uh, emerging local plan uh, have been subject to consultation, but we haven't yet considered the uh, consequences of that. Uh, and there isn't in front of the council at this stage a concrete uh, uh, funded or even um, proposal that is clearly deliverable uh, for the expansion of Milton Country Park. Now, those circumstances may change, uh, and um, over the uh, journey of this document through to adoption, uh, and we will obviously keep, keep that matter under review. Uh, but our advice is that uh, in the absence of um, certainty, which goes to the test of soundness of this plan when it's examined, uh, and all elements of it, um, it's not a position that we can uh, definitively link Milton Country Park uh, and the allocation of green infrastructure contributions uh, to um, its uh, expansion uh, at, at this moment in time. But as a, in answer to the uh, question or the comments from Mr. Littlewood, um, as I said, I'm sure we'll be keeping this under review as, as we progress over the next few years. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Okay, so I'm going to open up to Cabinet for questions initially. Um, so, Councillor John Williams at first, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Leader. Um, I want to pick up on the point that was um, that's made earlier by um, a, a previous mem a member of the public, this issue about why we have to make the decision now. And I think we, we have to bear in mind that the current local plan was adopted in 2018. Uh, and therefore, um, the review that's required under the NPPF has to be done by 2023. And I wouldn't want us to cause any delay in the uh, DCO process, which would mean that we would go back to uh, the speculative developments that happened around our villages because we didn't have an up-to-date local plan. I take your mind back to pre-2018 when our villages were ravished by developers, speculative developers, including my own village, who got planning permission for um, quite, you know, un, un sites that were not um, uh, you know, appropriate and were in the green belt for housing development. And I would not want to go back to that position. And therefore, I think it's very, very important that we do take the decision today to recommend the AAP to go forward so that we are, we are able to have a DCO decision that is within the time scale that's been set for us by the government's planning rules. Because I do, as I say, I do not want us to be to see people building homes on the green belt all over the district because we delayed this very important decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. And I think actually Mr. Kelly articulated uh, the risks of delay in his uh, answer to uh, to Mrs. Conroy's question. I don't know whether. Councillor Hawkins or, or Stephen want to add anything? No. Okay, uh, so next question from Councillor Neil Goff, please. Okay, thank you, Leader. Um, so I, I just wanted to say, I, I, look, I think this is a, a very exciting kind of prospect in development. This is, this is a site which is um, sustainable in a way that no other site really is in the, in the area. And it really offers the prospect of uh, a, a really exciting um, kind of enhancement to uh, to this this area. I, I, I think it's all about balance, isn't it? It's it's about getting the balance between the various uh, objectives right. And I I sort of know very uh, the, 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 a lot of attention has been paid by by officers to reflect comments and, and the adjustments and the balance between the sort of density, the heights, the the green space, and so forth. And I, and I, it, it's it's never going to be 
uh, perfect because there's always constraints, but I'm, I'm sort of comfortable that the balance of this is, is right. Um, I think the scrutiny raised, and we've discussed already quite a lot, the importance of, of sort of access to open and green space. Um, obviously, that can't solely be within the development, but it's all about the sort of connectivity uh, and the open space in the sort of general north area of, of Cambridge. And much of that uh, is also sort of contained within the sort of vision of the emerging local plan in terms of the connectivity and the open space. And I, 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 and I think that's a really important sort of concept is that this area action plan sort of sits within the broader context of the emerging local plan. And, 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 and that's an important area for me in terms of the enhanced connectivity, which we see to the site, not just into Cambridge, but also out from Cambridge to the north of the city uh, for the provision of uh, for that access to, uh, to open space, including, for example, the river and so forth. So, so that, that is really, really important. And um, I'm you know, very pleased that that's a, a large part of our emerging local plan too as well. And I, I think that's for me is important. I, I just don't know whether uh, Mr. Kelly would like to make any comment about, uh, we've talked a lot about this green space. We haven't talked so much about the connectivity uh, to this to this site and how that is the uh, the vision in the local plan relates to this sort of AAP and how they integrate in terms of that uh, that concept of connectivity to the broader open space. Sorry, Mr. Kelly, would you like to come in there, please? Um, thank you. Yes, I'll be I'll be um, I'll try to be rel relatively succinct. Um, yeah, quite rightly that we've highlighted uh, and Councillor Hawkins raised the fact that um, our uh, assessments uh, have identified this as a, uh, a very sustainable location for growth. Of course, um, there's a difference between the location and the type of development, but what we have tried to do, Councillor Goff raised the point about balance. Um, you'll recall that the, one of the, not only alongside um, uh, the environment and, and um, ecology, uh, but climate change and well-being are important threads in the local plan. Uh, and what we've tried to do here in striking that balance, even to things such as making sure that uh, we have a mix of uses, so that um, from the concerns that have been expressed about traffic, people can live, work and play uh, in this location and not have to travel, which is good for their well-being. It's also very good for the climate, uh, for carbon emissions. Uh, and it's also important that others around the site uh, and the connectivity points that Councillor Goff has raised, uh, both within Cambridge City, but, but equally uh, in the communities of South Cambridgeshire nearby. And we've got the greenways um, from GCP, we've got the cycle connections and the interplay with Water Beach, but also through the busway uh, and um, uh, the railway connections to those communities, both south and north and west of the city. Um, uh, that uh, uh, may well wish to either be working here or indeed may well wish to uh, live here but connect back to their families in, in the villages and so on uh, surrounding the area. So we have tried to strike uh, that balance, um, uh, mindful not just of absolute housing numbers but actually the transport effects, trying to get a mix of homes and jobs uh, to uh, reduce the pressure on the road network that people have expressed concern about um, but really importantly in terms of the design and layout, um, thinking around the local plan themes of well-being uh, and um, climate change, trying to make sure that um, it isn't some form of enclosed, uh, highly urbanised uh, and impenetrable kind of community. Uh, it's an open, inclusive uh, part of not just the city, but of, of, of Greater Cambridge. Um, uh, and uh, in due course, People will express their views on the consultation around the quite substantial changes that the report makes clear have been made in response to all of that feedback and the balance that we've tried to strike. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, and to me, you know, success will look like um, an area where people choose not to not to own a car because they don't need one, and um, you know, and that would be great. Um, Councillor Bran Mills, now, please. Yes, I'm, I, I was going to say more on the subject, but you, you've just both um, yourself uh, 
uh, leader and uh, Stephen Kelly have mentioned this and it was um, really this point that um, I think it was Mrs. Kath Martin earlier uh, public question answered uh, asked a question about um, whether or not we could reduce the car traffic and um, I, I think it it's really important that the public and uh, including Mrs. Uh, Martin understand that that's a, a really critical part of the development of the site. And, and um, I know at, uh, at the County Council Highways Committee, we've talked about uh, ensuring that not only LTN 120 uh, standards are adopted, but for example, there is provision for secure storage of uh, cargo bikes and e-cargo bikes on the site so so that actually we we don't need um, vehicles delivery vehicles attending on site when it can be done uh, in with uh, with bikes rather than uh, motorized uh, tra transport and so you know this low car uh, usage uh, across the site is a really critical part of that and the proximity of people to their jobs is a critical part of the development and I think that can actually provide the reduction in car uh, traffic that we're hoping to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor John Batchelor. Well, thank you, Leader. Um, I agree with everything that's gone, gone before, so I won't repeat all that. Um, this is a huge opportunity uh, for us all to actually uh, create something new, uh, something uh, innov innovative, um, and from my um, point of view as lead member for housing, I wouldn't underestimate the significance of delivering some 3,000 plus affordable houses out of this project. So I'm fully in favour. Let's push on to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. So if there's no more cabinet members wishing to speak, um, I've got Councillor Richard Williams. Thank, thank you very much, Leader, um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, there were just two points I really wanted to raise on this. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that the impression seems to be being given that this progressing this action plan is relevant to our five-year housing land supply. Um, and the current local plan, I mean, I, I, I'm sure Mr. Kelly would confirm uh, that it's not. Um, in terms of the, ha the review of the local plan, this is not relevant to the housing delivery test. It's not relevant to the five-year land supply. And the uh, land supply projections that we published in April last year, um, which apparently showed a, a six-year land supply, you know, which is great, do not rely on the Northeast Cambridge uh, site at all. Um, so this is not about our five-year land supply um, and, and somehow, you know, the local plan falling down. In fact, this is about the next local plan. It's not about the current local plan, um, as I think is pretty clear. that there, there is no allocation of housing on this site in the current local plan. It, it, it's all for the next local plan. And if we look at the action plan document itself, which is, is quite explicit, figure 45, you know, there are 650 houses possible at Chesterton sidings between 2025, 2030. But the bulk of the delivery of this site is post 2030s, 2030 to 2035. And in fact, the large majority or a large proportion of the housing here is not even going to be in the period of the next local plan. It's going to be in the local plan after the next one. Not even, you know, not the current one, not the next one, the one after. So I am rather concerned um, that the impression seems to be being given that we have to progress this today or that the five-year land supply is somehow in danger. That is not correct, and I'm sure Mr. Kelly um, would, would confirm that. Just in terms of delay, I mean, I, I think you've all heard the public speakers. I think they've made some very uh, good arguments for delay. I, I would urge the Cabinet to delay. I suspect it won't, but I would urge the Cabinet to delay this. And I would just add, finally, one other reason, um, and that's about the water supply. The Area Action Plan is itself quite explicit that this project could not be delivered by increased abstraction um, from the water supply. At the moment, there is no water supply for this. It's not deliverable. We are going to get the regional uh, water management plan soon. Um, but until we have that, we have no idea whether any of this is deliverable at all. So I, I really can't understand why the cabinet 
and the council leadership would not delay this at least until we get the water management plan and we know if and how any of this is is deliverable and that you know we may not have very long to wait for that thank you very much leader uh, thank you i'm going to bring in um stephen kelly i mean i suspect on you know with five-year housing land supplies one has to plan in advance you know you have to think well into the future about how you'll ma maintain them um but Stephen, would you like to comment on that and also on the uh, on the water supply, which I think we've been perfectly clear that uh, we're well aware of the limitations. Thank you, uh, Leader. Yes, uh, just to confirm, yes, it's not part of the five-year land supply. Um, and um, the way that it sits in the uh, next local plan housing trajectory means that it's not currently a calculation that factors into the housing delivery test. So Councillor Richard Williams is right about that. The point, um, however, around uh, an up-to-date local plan is that delay uh, of this um, uh, progression of, of this project may well give cause for delay to the DCO process uh, whilst the Council seeks further clarification on these points. Uh, and that because of the way that the local plan uh, has quite rightly, in my view, significant regards to the contribution this site makes to that local plan, not only from a housing perspective, but also from a jobs perspective and the policy context that it sets for development um, in uh, line with those objectives for sustainability and low carbon, um, risks the plan, the current local plan, so the current planning decisions that the council makes, not immediately, um, but in the period after uh, five years from the adoption of the current local plan, um, risks uh, creating a greater period of time after that in which you do not have a plan that is up to date. Uh, and um, you will recall in the matter of planning applications for five-year land supply, which were arguing that the housing needs justified development, that what the national planning policy framework does is it renders the current local plan policies um, uh, out of date and current government at the time, uh, NPPF or housing need objectives, um, preeminent in the decision-making process. So it's not a case that, and officers are not suggesting, um, and I don't think the council is, that not progressing the decision today would immediately jeopardize the five-year land supply uh, or um, the housing delivery test. But if uh, the, the failure to resolve a position on this document leads to a delay in the development consent order process that has the effect of, um, uh, because of the relationship with our local plan, pushing the conclusion of the local plan and the AAP process further into the future. That creates a risk after 2023, um, which cannot be recovered uh, of um, not having an up-to-date plan, and therefore the policies in the current local plan not applying as uh, robustly and preeminently uh, as they do at this moment in time to protect the villages and communities across Greater Cambridge. Um, on the second point around water and clarity, uh, obviously there are a number of issues that are justifying why we are not consulting on this document. Um, we spent a lot of time talking around the development consent order process Councillor Williams is quite right uh, that one of the other elements of soundness that the council has been really clear about uh, is the availability of water uh, to meet the needs of future growth without increasing abstraction. Uh, but all of the indications that we've had are that in the timescale before we begin consultation, so at the conclusion of the DCO process, which may be as far away as two years already, um, the uh, Water Resources East, water resources management plan will be both submitted and uh, adopted uh, or at least confirmed uh, identifying um, and indeed driving the water investment plans of the statutory undertakers uh, and we've been quite clear that on the local plan and likewise for the area action plan without that certainty uh, on future water supply we will not be uh, advocating either the levels of growth or the progression of the current spatial strategy. Uh, and so um, we're expecting, in fact, later this month, uh, the uh, initial draft of that plan to be published. 
but all of the advice we've received as officers uh, and as councils from the Water Resources East um, uh, organization are that the plan uh, will be uh, in place and sufficiently well advanced for the councils to be able to demonstrate uh, that it is sustainable and sound by the time we uh, propose in the resolution uh, today to go out to consultation. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, we've always been perfectly clear about our position regarding water. Um, Councillor Brian Milnes, your hand popped up. Did you want to comment on on you know this uh, specific particular points that we've just been discussing? Uh, no, thank you, Leader. I, I was just going to um, uh, uh, declare a potential um, in, interest in that. Um, I'm a highways uh, committee member on the county council, which has discussed this, as as I mentioned in my comments. So I just want to make sure that that's that's clear. Thank you. Um, so you're so you're declaring an interest as a member of the highways committee at the county, so, which I'm going to bring in Councillor uh, Peter Macdonald as well on this one. Uh, yeah, thanks, Leader. Although I haven't commented on this, I have commented on Cambridge South. Um, as uh, uh, both cabinet member and chair of uh, highways, so uh, there is potentially an interest to declare. Thank you. So, so you're declaring an interest as well. Okay, is that Dr. Wright, Rory? Yeah. Okay, that's super. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, uh, so I've got Councillor Claire Dawn for next. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd like to make two points, please. Um, one is in relation to the comments from the scrutiny committee, and I think that Councillor Ripeth referred to this, and uh, it was the comments that we made on um, the height of the buildings on the AAP. Um, and I'm very pleased to see that comments at an earlier stage in discussions were taken into account um, so that the height has been reduced. And I think this is particularly important for some of the communities, um, some of our residents, particularly in the villages of Fenditton and other areas around um, that part of the district. Um, the, the impact of very tall buildings on those established communities, not just the height, but also potential light pollution. So I'm really pleased to see the reduction in height across the site. Uh, that's one point. And my other point is um, on uh, policy under policy 11, housing design standards. Um, I'm very pleased to see the particular mention of whole life housing uh, population projections for Greater Cambridge show a significant increase in the over 65s. And this um, site will make provision for whole life housing as well as the 5% of new homes uh, with wheelchair accessibility. So I'm really pleased to see very specific mentions of those two points. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I have a number of points that I just wanted to seek clarification on. Um, and there are five. So, the first one relates to formal open space for sports pitches and recreation grounds. Um, I pointed out to Scrutiny and Overview Committee that this development seeks to provide homes for 16,000 residents in due course and 15,000 employees, all of whom will need space to relax and uh, get out in the open air. And if the pandemic did nothing else, it showed us how much people actually benefited from and appreciate having somewhere to walk out in the open air, but also um, to play sports. And one of the things that seems to be somewhat absent from policy eight, or rather it refers to it all being delivered off site, uh, is, is this formal open space. So that includes sports pitches and recreation grounds. Um, and the reason I'm concerned about it because, is because, as, as Councillor Hawkins has said, there are green spaces that people can walk to within five minutes from their home. But if young kids want to play football um, on, a, on a football pitch, then there isn't really very much provision here. And the, there's a reference, as we've heard earlier on, to off-site provision. Um, but uh, as... Um, 
Mr. Kelly said with regards to you know, the possible extension of Milton Country Park. I know that's open space, but there's no position, no, no, not yet a position on where and how far off-site green space might be. Um, and that applies to um, formal sports places as well. And I would point out, I'll come back if I may to the informal open green space, but certainly at the moment, for example, the village of Milton, which is likely to be the, the go-to place for sports pitches, we already are short of two sports pitches for our own population in Milton. Um, and elsewhere in the document, it referred to, and indeed Stephen Kelly has also said this, it's important that people live, work and play in this location. And yet there isn't formal sports uh, provision of sufficient size in this location for formal sport, formal sports for pitches. And, and, but that would include things like, um, you know, in a broader sense, you know, tennis courts, netball courts, for, for the employees who are going to be working here as well. So I'm very concerned that this development should be seeking to wash its own face with regard, I don't like that expression, but it, it should be seeking to provide within the development so that people can walk to these football games or, or netball games and not have to go somewhere off site. Um, and we've got all the way through, there is very vague reference to you know, off-site provision somewhere between, you know, somewhere to the north. It doesn't really say where. So I'm really concerned about that. Um, moving, shifting slightly to informal space, the, the concern about the use of Milton Country Park is serious. It's really severe. Certainly during the pandemic, um, I started to use Milton Country Park because it's on my doorstep. And I stopped using it because it got so busy. There were so many people walking around. It, was, it felt crowded. And I know I've spoken to um, the chief exec executive who also feels the same, that the, the, the paths are beaten down by footfall. Um, the paths have got wider and wider. The spaces that were available for actually the wildlife and the bird life and the plant life have become smaller and smaller as time's gone on. Um, in addition, I would add to that the fact that, of course, the other informal local space, although it's a public right of way, is the River Cam towpath, um, which is very much a circular route for people. But also, that again feels really very crowded often. Um, and so, this is another reason why we need more provision of informal open space as well. So, that's the first item. The second item is about community buildings and community facilities. I can see no reference to, or very oblique reference to, space for faith and worship. Now this is going to be a very big population, and um, I raised it at, at Scrutiny and Overview, and I can't see any greater um, acknowledgement of this in the new plan. I might have missed it. But I'm really concerned that there should be designated space for faith because there's 16,000 residents going to be there in future. Um, there's reference to shared communal facilities, and I'm all for that, you know, when there's when that's appropriate. But actually, I do think there should be space for faith. Um, the um, third thing, uh, sorry, so the first, sorry, the first one I was talking about, formal open spaces policy for eight. That the, 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 the communal space uh, is policy 14. Um, the other reference I made in scrutiny and overview related to space for cemetery provision. Uh, we know to our cost that actually cemeteries are needed, space for burial or even space for interment of ashes is, is important to plan for early on um, and to make sufficient provision. Now, I remember when I raised this earlier on, uh, Matthew Patterson um, referred to um, a need for two hectares of cemetery space, and they were looking to ex extend existing cemeteries to provide this. But actually, it's not clear where that would be. And again, if that's, uh, you know, if they're considering extending the Milton Cemetery, that will require land purchase 
uh, in excess. So we need to make provision for that. And also, for any community, it's nice to be able to just walk to your relative's grave um, or ashes uh, memorial and put some flowers on or go and see the face. You don't necessarily want to have to go in a car. Um, the final thing I wanted to just raise, um, seek clarification on, is there is reference in the officer report on page 59 in the agenda to safeguarded uses. And there's reference to, of course, the aggregates railhead and um, the waste transfer station. But actually, what I, what I was concerned about in, when we're looking at it in scrutiny and overview, you will know that there is a plan to put a pedestrian bridge over the railway to the green space on the, uh, by the river on the east side of the railway. But I have asked whether we need to be safeguarding space, and I know you'll throw your hands up in horror at this, but whether we need to safeguard space for a future vehicle bridge crossing in the case that network rail at some time in the future either make life at Fen Road Chesterton, which you'll appreciate is also my parish, <coughs> impossible because in, even initially, um, under the Ely Area Transport, uh, Ely Area Capacity Study, Phase 2, they're looking at closing crossings, not, not the Fen Road Chesterton crossing, but they are looking at close, closing other crossings because of the increased frequency of trains, particularly for freight, that they're planning to put through. And I'm just worried that in future, we might have a situation where they don't close the crossing, but the downtime is so great as to make life on the remote side of the Fen Road Chesterton crossing really, really difficult. We have some, um, over, I think we have probably approaching a thousand residents and employees on the remote side of that crossing. Um, I asked Councillor Hazel Smith because she's good at numbers and she remembers the uh, numbers of uh, mobile home Home, uh, mobile homes and vans that are there and she said I think it's not far off a thousand. Now we must make sure that we have provision for those residents and the numerous employees on that side of the crossing in the case that it either becomes impossible to take your children to school, to get to work because the uh, level crossing gates are down for such a long time or in the case that Network Rail ever should decide to close that gateway altogether that level crossing altogether. Um, I know they haven't any plans to do that at present, but actually I was, I was seeking reassurance in the papers um, about that aspect, and actually I found it really worrying because somewhere in the papers it said um, that actually you hadn't had any communication with Network Rail um, for a very long time. Uh, paragraph 40 on page 62 says, despite early engagement and discussions on this issue, and how options for addressing it could be considered through the Ely Area Capacity Enhancement Programme, there has not been any direct engagement from Network Rail for a number of months. Now, I find that really worrying. Um, it doesn't surprise me, because Network Rail are quite slow to respond on many occasions, but I am worried about this crossing in future seeking to be closed by Network Rail. So I would like your um, thoughts on those matters, please. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradman. I'm going to come initially to Councillor Toomey Hawkins to see if she wants to respond. I mean, I think, you know, most of your points were in the um, scrutiny and overview report um, and have had considerable attention already. But uh, Councillor Hawkins, um, do you want to comment on these? And, you know, if you want to uh, defer to uh, Stephen Kelly, please do. Oh, sorry, uh, for completeness of information, I will defer to um, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, uh, it just, uh, we have talked about uh, open space, but just to clarify, there is 1.6 hectares of formal open space anticipated in the current um, uh, area action plan. Now, that's uh, in the form of um, uh, consideration of some of the kind of uh, multi-use games areas and, and things like that that we're confident can sit within the typology of place that we've identified. Um, there are potentially further opportunities for things like rooftop courts and so on 
to be provided, but because we can't quantify that because the detail in an area action plan or a local plan document is not the same as the detail in a, um, a planning application, we uh, don't want to essentially um, rely upon that. We have, in response to the uh, queries that were raised about formal open space, uh, considered what the consequences would need to be. And you, um, Councillor Bradman will recall that scrutiny committee um, to, for example, increase the formal open space provision from around 9% at the moment to, for example, 20% um, would require an additional, um, uh, a substantial additional areas of um, open space to be set aside. And of course, um, formal sports spaces and pitches generally need to be much more tightly managed so that the safety of the surface for the users can be safeguarded. Um, uh, and in this case, that would require acres of land within the middle of this site to be effectively earmarked for that purpose only. We have proposed a five-court indoor um, sports facility as part of the calculations uh, in the uh, scheme and through the infrastructure study uh, see, for example, things like faith space uh, as a really important part of the kind of cultural offer provided. Now, um, we haven't been explicit because we haven't got absolute clarity on exactly what faiths and what their space requirements would be. Um, but there is um, a substantial amount of floor space set aside for uh, what is now use class E, which includes the very broad panoply of town centre type uses, Primarily, if you um, uh, have looked at the document uh, on things uh, like ground floors, some of those active street frontages that we're proposing. Um, and that um, class E uh, space includes assembly and leisure, so faith um, uh, activities. So the scheme, it, the, the, the site, it's the, the plan itself provides something in the order of 12,000 square meters of space, some of which will be available, uh, I'm sure, for faith and community groups, um, and which we can explore as we go through uh, planning applications to see both the types and requirements for early delivery. Um, in terms of the cemetery expansion, um, you're quite right, the, the AAP seeks contributions towards uh, enlargement and extension of those facilities. Now that's something we've got to look at in the context of the wider local plan anyway, uh, with the population increase in the city of Cambridge, but also uh, in some of our uh, surrounding communities uh, and so I suspect um, that the right forum for that to be picked up is through the local plan infrastructure planning process albeit that as you've noted Councillor Bradnam the, the document recognises that it is nevertheless uh, an important infrastructure need that we need to satisfy. The only benefit in or one of the benefits of course from North East Cambridge is that it is so well connected to non-car based transport as well as car based transport solutions um, that one hopes that uh, that off-site provision is at least more accessible than perhaps from many other parts. Um, in respect to the point around the bridge and safeguarded land, um, it is a, a difficult issue because Network Rail have not requested that we safeguard land and therefore in order to be able to justify safeguarding it uh, and the very, very substantial costs in terms of um, the development value that would be foregone in order to build not just a road bridge, but the abutments and the kind of gradients and so on, um, there is no justification being provided from Network Rail to um, require safeguarding, um, which is fundamentally what would be necessary through the um, plan examination to offset. The, um, and of course, there may well be other options for meeting access requirements to Fen Road that would need to be explored as part of an exercise to consider whether a road bridge is the best, uh, a road bridge into the into the site is the best solution uh, in this particular case. Uh, as you're aware, the AAP does highlight the importance of cycle and pedestrian connectivity um, uh, between uh, the um, site and the river, but also with access to. to to Fen Road and, and, and so on. Uh, so I think um, those are probably, hopefully, elements of clarification on the points that you've um, raised. Uh, we, we touched upon the informal open space uh, and clearly the design of those open spaces. For anyone that's familiar with the kind of wide variety of urban park forms um, can embrace both 
uh, frisbee playing and football kickabout, but actually, given things like the size and scale of the linear park, space we hope for quiet contemplation, for kind of informal interaction and perhaps more um, gentle pursuits of uh, activities to support well-being. So a variety of, um, of, of forms uh, of those parks and spaces across, across the North East Cambridge area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, Councillor Judith Ripper, then if you want to come back in. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I just want to really stress again, more I suppose now as a local member rather than vice chair of scrutiny, but 20% biodiversity net gain on site is brilliant. That's really good. But we have to be so careful that that isn't lost elsewhere that that doesn't ha accidentally come to pass. And then going back to the recommendations, I'm sure you'll take those on board and we'll really look at recommendations A to F um, as something which is so important um, with this going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, and I mean, 20% biodiversity is no mean feat, actually, we now, we now know, um, but absolutely we can't use it elsewhere. Um, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to say anything in summary? Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, a lot has been said already. Um, all I can do is reiterate my thanks to everyone uh, who's been involved in this in one way or the other. Um, and really, just to say, look, we, we, we are progressing with this, and I'm still recommending that we um, accept uh, this proposed submission um, because it sets out what it is we want to do um, with the uh, NEC site um, once we're able to do that. Um, and let's look forward to the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So as your seconder, I'll just say a few words. So, uh, so firstly, I would like to commend the officers <coughs> who've, who've done all the work, but in particular produced this report. I mean, it is an absolute exemplar of clarity and attractiveness. I love the infographics in it. It's so easy to negotiate your way round. And it's that's something that's rarely seen in council papers. It's now routinely seen in papers from this council. But, you know, it, it, is, it is a really, really excellent and enjoyable document. And the graphics are fabulous. And the information is presented so clearly and, you know, with really very, very little amb ambiguity that I can find. So, so my thanks to everybody involved in that. It is, it's, some, it's a piece of work that we should be really proud of. <laughs> and going on to, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, mask wearing isn't easy. Um, so I am confident that North East Cambridge is going to be an absolute exemplar in its own right of low carbon 21st century urban living. You know, it's, this isn't a village, this, this is urban living. And I think it's what I see in the report here and what I've heard today um, it gives me huge confidence that this is going to be somewhere which, you know, hopefully I'll still be alive by the time it's finished, but I can walk around and be really, really proud of what this council and its partners have, have created. Um, you know, we have to, you know, we, a bit like the Cambridge South Station, we have to make sure that our high ambitions translate through to, de to delivery and that we are creating a fantastic place for the residents of South Cambridgeshire and Cambridge City to live, somewhere they want to stay, somewhere they want to work, somewhere where they want to, uh, to bring up their families and look after their loved ones. So, you know, with 40% housing that is truly affordable, it says in the paper, um, jobs that are walking distance from where people live, five minute walk to, you know, to get to, uh, to green space, no fossil fuels, you know, a low carbon district, somewhere where, as I said earlier, you know, car ownership is really optional. You don't fit like living in London. You know, there are so many viable low carbon alternatives that why own an expensive car? So I am hugely supportive of this. Um, you know, it, it also protects the countryside. The, this development will protect our villages from development which is not sustainable. It is the most sustainable site in, in Cambridgeshire. And I am very proud of the work that uh, this council has done. So moving on to the, uh, the recommendations now, which I'm not going to read because they are long. They are set out in paragraph six of the report. Uh, so do members agree with the proposals? 
Uh, does anyone wish to vote against the proposals? Uh, anyone wish to abstain? Okay, so Cabinet therefore agrees the proposals by affirmation. So we have now reached um, the end of the agenda. Uh, thank you ever so much for uh, joining us to view today's Cabinet meeting or to participate in it. And I note that the next meeting of Cabinet is scheduled to take place on Monday the 7th of February 2022 at 10 o'clock in the morning. So thank you very much and if we could end the live stream now.